Well, I think the top of the hour is in play, so I'm going to kick things off. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you all here today. We have a great guest covering an important topic, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I'm just delighted to welcome Tony Zanders. You see, ever since the beginning of the forum, ever since our first month, we've been focused on, among other things, the role of libraries and what they mean for higher education and what they mean for society as a whole. We've hosted guest after guest who has been giving us different views of the library world. Now, Tony comes to us with a view from the software entrepreneur side, library technology side. Um, he is just a dynamic, wonderful person, and I'm absolutely delighted to bring him up. So without any further ado, I'll beam him up on stage. Welcome, Tony. Hello. I've never seen myself this big on a Zoom. Well, here, let me make it even bigger still. How's this? <laughs> nice. Nice to be here. Thanks, Brian. Oh, what my pleasure. Where are you today, Tony? I'm in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I'm in our office. I uh, just shut my door to try to get some quiet. And um, uh, yeah, it's about 72 degrees here outside, about 60 degrees here inside. And how's the humidity? Uh, it's perfect for now. Uh, we're still dealing with the beginning of allergy season. Uh, yeah. We got about three more weeks before the humidity comes. So I remember this. I, I used to uh, teach in uh, Shreveport. So I remember okay. you know, and, and summers I would just be, you know, um, but, yeah. um, well, listen, Tony, the, the tradition we have on the forum is we ask people to introduce themselves, not by talking about their past, but by talking about their future. What are you going to be working on for the next year? What are the big topics? What are the big projects that are just really top of mind for you? Uh, that's a good question. I've never heard that framing before. Uh, the next 12 months, I think, are going to be in two areas for me personally. I think um, every day we're talking with libraries, um, library managers on how are they grappling with coming out of the pandemic um, to run their organizations in this new normal. Um, and so that's one area that I spend at least an hour a day talking with folks on. Um, at Skill Type, we use data to help them make better decisions. And so that's one area. I think the second area is exploring um, how to help libraries become sustainable from a, a financial perspective. And so libraries are cost centers on campus and that historically may have worked out if you knew for sure that you were going to get a certain budget. Uh, but that's no longer the, the case. That certainty started to go out the window. And so I also think pretty deeply about how to generate revenue for libraries. And I think we're going to make some progress on that conversation this year as well. Yeah, I'd love to hear any, any uh, solutions you have on that topic. Uh, and I'm sure quite a few people in the audience would love to hear that as well. Um, now, how oh, uh, and skill type? Tell us about skill type. How's it coming, and what does it do? Yeah, it's it's coming along quite great. Uh, we're in a much different situation today than twelve months ago. Um, and so, about four years ago, I decided to leave EBSCO, which is a global mm -hmm. database company, um, and really spend my days working with libraries to understand what were their biggest challenges. Uh, that weren't being solved at all. And the recurring theme was uh, managing our, our organization's people. And um, that led to us building a community of about 12 libraries, some professional associations like the Black Caucus of ALA, NASIC, mm -hmm. others, um, to start rethinking the way um, we manage our talent. Um, and uh, that community winded up producing a software platform that has a focus on using data to help us make better decisions as professionals, uh, but also helping our organizations make better decisions using our um, what we understand about our skills and our skill gaps as an organization. Um, so we're trying to have a more data informed conversation around um, our career goals and our organizational goals. Uh, and at a, so at a high level, that's what skill types hoping to accomplish. Wow, that's quite a lot. And when you mention skills, do you mean um, uh, skills in terms of library science and organization, or do you mean uh, management skills? 
all of the above. And so as we understand, libraries are very complex organizations. Um, when yeah. you look across all of the core competency frameworks that are created by, say, the American Library Association or the Special Libraries Association, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you can start to understand that there's actually hundreds of discrete competencies that are required to run a modern research library. Um, and so that includes some things that are very specific to libraries, like electronic resource management or digital asset mm -hmm. management. Yeah. But it also includes business skills like HR, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. public speaking, license negotiation, mm -hmm. IT, um, data. And so libraries sit at this interesting juncture on campus uh, where they have to meet the needs of students um, and there are space students can come to, but they also are in the academic realm as well, partnering with faculty on the research side. So there's a lot of competencies that are required today to run a, a modern um, research library. Oh, that's extremely important to hear. Um, do you, well, I, I have more questions, but but let me just let me just turn this around. Uh, so first of all, it sounds like everyone's going to be digging into skill type and learning about what you all do. But let me just emphasize the Future Transform is a conversation venue for all of you. So this is the place for you to put your questions uh, to Tony. If you'd like to ask him about uh, libraries after COVID and how they change, or if you'd like to ask about libraries in terms of financial sustainability, or in terms of the issues that he was just talking about, in terms of what skill type addresses, in terms of management of a complex organization, a dynamic environment, this is your time. This is your place to do so. And again, you can hit that raised hand button for joining us on stage, and I promise to make you big. Um, or you just type in your question in the Q&A box. And, you know, I don't even get a chance to finish saying that before someone asks a question. This is great. Um, so we have a question from John Hollenbeck. Hello, John. And uh, John asks, let me put this up on stage for everyone to see, aren't libraries based on scarcity? How do they pivot to electronic text and the internet? A big foundational question. Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, everyone would agree with that. I think there's a general uh, expectation at especially larger research libraries to try to um, provide access to the, the world of information resources on behalf of patrons uh, and on behalf of, of researchers uh, and to be the gateway to helping interpret that world. Um, and, and so uh, you have a variety of types of collaborations. Uh, entire consortia are created for the purpose of creating the, the, the largest possible shared collection as possible. And, and so, um, I, I think I'm following the, the line of questioning around scarcity, but I think the other side of that coin is that um, it's the library's role to secure uh, rights and privileges and access to the, the broadest set of, of, of scholarly research on behalf of their customers um, and to help ensure that that research can be accessed at, at the right time. Um, and so you have library consortia, but you also have collaborations like the Hadi Trust Mm -hmm. and others that are trying to uh, Internet Archive, uh, the Digital Public Library of America. There's a, a litany of, of groups that are trying to remove the barriers to access, um, to remove that scarcity. Well, that's that's a great way of putting this. Um, uh, thank you. In fact, John wants to join us on stage, so let's put him on so he can talk with us and, and develop this further. Hello, John. Hello, hello. I, I didn't word that very well, I guess. That's but okay. What I meant by scarcity is like the, the Library of Alexandria was the only place all those scrolls existed. And I always feel like school was instituted on the notion of knowledge scarcity, that you had to go to see Brian Alexander to learn something. And so libraries kind of, you know, what I mean by that is that libraries to me are conceptualized as buildings that have the book. But now with electronic media and the internet, the book is more ubiquitous even research libraries and i'm i'm wondering you know so that to me would be a foundational shift from i i'll just say gatekeeper i, I guess i'm not a, today's my non-expressive day but you know you know what i mean yeah so yeah i think I, I have a better understanding now so 
that shift began to take place in the 80s uh, before I was born. And so right. I, was, I was born in 1986. Oh, God, and, don't say that. Um, oh, oh, oh. I had to do it. Uh, oh, but um, but really a couple funny. years before that, um, you had this transition from the card catalog to the, the first integrated library system. Um, and that was out of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Mm. And so the library has been at the core of helping reconceptualize itself to meet these um, new expectations that researchers and students have since forever. And so um, even looking past the 80s, when we went to the ILS, um, the next decade or so where that started to transition again was getting into uh, electronic resources. So not just managing the print resources in, an, um, in a networked environment, but now starting to um, publish research in an electronic format, which brought on its own need for better tools for, for management and description and, and access. And then you fast forward another 10 years to the 2000s uh, where we're starting to get into uh, digital asset management and starting to scan and digitize uh, porn, born print materials um, for discovery and for access, right? And so um, I think the reconceptualization of libraries has been taking place for decades. Mm -hmm. And it's been run and governed by the librarian community itself. They know best what are the more efficient ways to provide that service? And so today, fast forward, we have to sort of reframe our understanding of a library much broader than the brick and mortar building itself. The way students are trying to access these resources and faculty are trying to organize these resources oftentimes is outside of that brick and mortar building, right? Mm -hmm. And as universities, start to invest more in distance education and remote learning. Um, the pandemic really just put an exclamation point on a number of trends that had been sort of bubbling up for uh, years. Uh, but we really have to reconceptualize the library to serve a sort of a locationless community. Um, and so the most important ingredient in this equation are the people. Uh, it requires experts who understand the needs of the patrons, but also understand the needs of the institution, which involve their economic constraints, the legal constraints, the copyright and the privileges constraints, mm -hmm. along with making sure interpreting that complex web to provide that seamless access to students and researchers and doing mm -hmm. it in a way that serves a community that may never walk through your your gates or your your doors. Mm. Well, that's first of all, I just got to thank you. That was the the best history of the library in the past thirty years that I've heard in mm. under two minutes. That's that's amazing. <laughs> that's a lot to cover. John, does does does, does that help? Does that help address? It helps. It, it's it's interesting because there's so many different aspects to this, and I, I you know I look at libraries librarians is helping tame the fire hose and helping with things like we call information literacy now, but I also reflect on going back as far as Vannevar Bush with the idea of linking text and the, the great Brown intermedia project that got swamped by hypercard for some reason, but, you know, just all these attempts to come up with ways of linking and organizing knowledge that I think really is the problem of our day that, you know, even Dewey wrote about in Democracy and Education is we just have too much stuff. And how do we make that workable and realizable? Well, we turn to librarians for invaluable help is, is my guess. Yeah. John, cool. this is great. thank you for coming up. Take care. Thanks for having me. Uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, this is uh, how to ask a video question. You can see it's very easy and that we're, we're very kind. Um, and uh, even to people who don't have beards. No, I'm kidding. Um, we're, um, but let me um, uh, welcome a few other questions that have just come up. Uh, and here is one from uh, Rebecca Jones. So let me flash this on the screen. Tony, delighted to see you presenting here. What is a development you've seen in the past 12 months that raises your concern the most 
for post-secondary higher education libraries? And she's asking about Canada and the U.S. Uh, I think... Um, I'll put that back up on the screen again because that was... A, yeah, first... thanks, thanks for that. And so um, I think the biggest concern is uh, sort of lack of uh, empathy towards the situation the library workforce is in. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's been, just to tie this back to John's line of questioning, there's been this uh, sort of um, impression that the libraries are these sort of buildings and spaces and these sort of boundless collections that manage themselves. And um, we all can agree that that's not the case, but that's the sort of impression that we, we approach the institution of librarianship with. And um, the cost of that has been that we are currently in a talent crisis uh, mm. where um, we not only are experiencing um, collective burnout and mm. a, a shortage of the expertise that we need, yeah as we're shifting from a primary print in-person experience to a fully digital, fully remote experience, the skills that are needed to provide the same services are quite different. Mm -hmm. And so we're in this digital shift that's taking place, which only exacerbates the talent crisis that we're in because the curricula that's been developed by information science programs, what, those curricula were designed during a time where we were mostly in person and we were mostly dealing with monographs. And so there's this lag of the training and the curriculum, and it simply hasn't caught up to the pace and rate of change of the demands that are being placed onto the libraries. So, even, yeah. Even that, I was going to say, even now in 2022, I mean, after, after all, um, you know, a generation of the web, I mean, we're still lagging. I, I, I would certainly say so, and I think that that's a consensus agreement, um, but certainly open for disagreement. Um, mm -hmm. The way curricula is developed at an information science program, uh, and the way decisions are made and what goes into that curricula is over a century old. And so it mm -hmm. takes on average about 10 or 12 different votes from various committees at a university to mm -hmm. add a course or a new topic to a curriculum. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if we acknowledge the rate of change with technology and with society and with user behavior, it's moving quite at a, at a pace that that voting model and the decision-making model for the curricula development simply hasn't caught up with. Well, that's a huge issue. Um... And, and that's, that's a great answer um, uh, to Rebecca's excellent question. Um, uh, in the chat, a couple of people have added a couple of notes that I, I, I wanted to uh, uh, re, you know, hoist back up for people to see. Um, uh, Kimberly mentions the pay scales for librarians versus IT professionals is really harming the profession. Uh, so you can get paid more in IT depending so on who you So I actually have a, 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 a strong conviction on this. And so yeah. the pay scales and pay grades that um, she's describing, I think, need to be at the top of the conversation. Um, those are quite outdated as well, again, based on job families and the, mm -hmm. the um, institutional uh, structures of the library before this digital shift took place that I just described, right? And so HR departments haven't stayed abreast of the evolution we just walked through starting in the 80s that today the typical library job and experience looks a lot similar to an IT job and experience and so an information professional is no longer stacking books on the shelf as the primary work they do yeah they're helping students and researchers troubleshoot broken URLs, or they're having to contact vendors to understand why a certain article no longer belongs in a package, or 
as why is my device not connecting to uh, the, the 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 Wi-Fi or I'm on campus, but the proxy server isn't acknowledging my my credentials. Th these are very technical and very specifically IT types of tasks that reference librarians have to address, mm -hmm. um, systems librarians, technical services, um, and, and I haven't even gotten into the entire web services side of things where a lot of the interactions take place through online chat and mm -hmm. through uh, authentication and, and, and other issues. And so yeah. it's my view that the pay scales have to start to right size to acknowledge the IT nature of the library work. That's a great, that's a great cause. Um, thank you for saying that. Uh, and, and there's one more to add to this, uh, to all these different information technology skills. Uh, Valerie Hawkins reminds us of the sequence information literacy, digital literacy, data literacy, digital dexterity, which librarians often end up having to teach uh, and advocate for. Well, this is okay. So, first of all, first of all, uh, Rebecca, great question to start to to get us rolling with this. Um, and friends, you can see how Tony has a huge wealth of knowledge uh, and a lot of passion, and the incredibly rare ability to say this with great concision. Um, so, please come up with your question. I can only get to say finish saying that sentence ever because you guys have so many questions. Uh, we have one from Tom Hames coming to us from uh, the Houston, Texas area. Uh, Tom says, do you think most outsiders, like non-library faculty, students, administrators, do they understand librarians as curators of information rather than curators of artifacts, physical holdings? I don't, I'm not sure that outsiders uh, know what to think of the, the modern information professional. Uh, I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that most outsiders acknowledge their existence at all. I, again, I think that people I hear I have conversations all the time with people that don't realize that people actually work at libraries. Um, the conception is that there's this building I can walk into. Right. Right. I can get access to Wi-Fi. I can perhaps get a coffee. I may see some books. I may not. I can sit down and I don't have to really interact with anyone. <laughs> and um, that coupled with the dawn of e-commerce and Amazon and Barnes and Noble and, you know, the, 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 the proliferation of Starbucks uh, and all of these trends, I think, really hide the, the, the work of the modern information professional. And so I... I think even your description uh, is a bit generous because it does assume that people acknowledge the the work and presence of, of librarians, and I don't I don't think that society does. Wow, that's a and you and that's a dark view, um, and that's one that we should change uh, as much as we can. Uh, friends, we have um, we have time for your questions, and I want to encourage you to uh, to bring them in. Um, we have a, a lively activity in the chat, uh, Tony, uh, where uh, uh, Kimberly uh, um says that educating up is a constant for academic libraries and librarians. Uh, not a question, just an observation, which uh, I think absolutely true. Um, and she says in terms of uh, what libraries do with technology, information, and everything else. Um, while people are, are, are thinking hard about, um, about their topics, uh, let me ask one, um, if I could press on that point of information literacy. I mean, e enormous credit to the library profession for coming up with information literacy in the 1980s, before the web began, or I should say, Tony, when you were a kid. Um, the, uh, uh, and, it's a great, great decade. Uh, yes, apparently so. <laughs> and, and, and the idea that uh, libraries can help librarians and libraries can help us all sift through the wild west of the uh, digital content frontier. Um, 
I'm, I'm curious right now, ever since 2016, we've been more, as a society, we've been more and more anxious about um, fake news, about misinformation, about disinformation. Uh, and right now with the war in Ukraine, there's even more demand for this. In fact, yesterday I saw the first uh, deep fake video of uh, Ukraine's president. Um, what, what can academic librarians do to help us and us meeting people in academia, first of all, uh, to help us sift through and develop these skills to handle this wild information world. I think, firstly, just continuing to occupy this uh, unique space on campus that is both one that is non-academic, so libraries have to interface with the facilities and security department on campus. They have to interface with um, student success and, and, and other groups that on campus that aren't related to the classroom and the academy, but they also very much so are embedded in the academic work of a research institution. And so I think the first thing is for, the, for us to all to acknowledge that unique hybrid role of both um, being able to um, have a, 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 a value add conversation with a faculty member and 30 minutes later have a mental health related conversation with a student who feels pressure. That is a very unique role on campus. And uh, so I think firstly, just to acknowledge the unique role of the library, I think secondly, um, I've seen many institutions incorporate the library into freshman orientation uh, and really embedding um, InfoLit as a, 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 a key part of the introduction to the academy. Um, and so those are two sort of things that I believe, uh, first, we just need to acknowledge that there is no other group or uh, expertise on campus that can do both as well as the library, but also find ways to um, seek out their services uh, because libraries also sit across all majors and disciplines, across all academic departments. And so each department on campus has a different vantage point when it comes to things like fake news and um, uh, information literacy. So uh, the library is the one to tie it all together. And so it's very much so a service center. Um, and I always have to just emphasize that it's the people. Um, so if you find a LibGuide or a, a web page uh, that is providing insight on how to navigate fake news, there's a person who authored that LibGuide, right? And so it all comes back to the people and the expertise. Um, and just looking at them as a, as a service provider that will reinvent itself to meet the needs of the, the time. And we've been seeing that well before the 80s, but my introduction to this uh, as a library technologist um, mm -hmm. is when that card catalog converted to the ILS. So, but they've, libraries have always adapted and evolved to meet the, the, the needs that were presented to them. That's true, that's true. Um, well, this is, um, thank you for that very, very excellent and actionable answer uh, to my very peremptory question. Uh, we have uh, more questions coming in, and this is from uh, J.D. Mosley Matchett, uh, who asks, so, so how should our higher ed libraries pivot if they are still a collection of physical books that are molding on shelves? Where can our traditional librarians turn to get tips for how to change? Um, well, one answer is skill type. Um, and so we've aggregated uh, thousands of library trainings from the world's best library conferences, uh, professional associations. It's become the single best place to find out what are the best practices for any given challenge that I'm facing. Um, and so you can find um, many examples nowadays of libraries who have responded to this particular issue um, by doing analyses of the usage of their collections and understanding how long has it been since a particular book has been checked out. 
Um, and if the book hasn't been checked out in a really long time, there's an argument that that book shouldn't take up precious real estate in our, our campus. And so as a result, an entire economy worth of companies have sort of been created to serve this need by um, not only providing that, that collection usage analysis, mm -hmm. but then providing actionable steps for libraries to then move the books out of that physical space into things like offsite cold storage or um, centralized collections where instead of each of our institutions all holding a copy of a book that may or may not ever get checked out again, we can collaborate as a consortium or a group and hold a single copy and through things like interlibrary loan and other tools, uh, we can make sure that the off chance someone wants it, someone can get that book in a, in a, in a decent amount of time. And so um, I would just encourage your library um, to sort of attend the conferences, uh, um, sign up for skill type, uh, go to various presentations on this topic. But there's a, there's a lot of things happening around uh, things like offsite cold storage, uh, automated uh, storage and retrieval systems. So, so AS, uh, AR, ASRSs and things like this. Um, University of Utah is an example of a, a, a wonderful um, warehouse. They've installed one of these beautiful systems. Oh, great. Um, um, so yeah, there's a lot there. JD, that's a great question uh, and a very practical question. And uh, I think Tony, again, just gave us a, a wonderful set of marching orders on, on how to do this. Um, uh, Thank you. And more questions have come up. Uh, one from our dear friend, George Station out on the West Coast, Cal State Monterey Bay. Uh, George asks, how can we encourage more publishers to support fuller ebook access, e.g. on the users, as routine and not, quote, hard? Uh, this, this is a great, great question. Um, so uh, that takes us, I don't know if you've all experienced this, but this is often an issue of publishers which will make available a limited number of digital copies, uh, kind of representing the analog space so that there's only a few copies that can be checked out at a time rather than the infinite supply of PDFs and so on. Um, what do you think? What do you think, Tony? Um, so uh, as a sort of entrepreneur at heart, uh, I started my career in, in Silicon Valley um, and developed my professional worldview um, surrounded by companies like Facebook and Twitter and, and LinkedIn in its early days and, and the host of other companies. And um, as a result, my worldview always is that if there's a problem that needs to change or, or be disrupted, um, there is a way uh, to use technology to change that. Um, we have to support um, the um, innovation, we have to support entrepreneurship, we have to support experimentation. We can't have a, um, um, a, co uh, um, a combative uh, view towards these things because the solutions to these sticky problems are oftentimes going to come from the edges mm -hmm. of, of, our, of our work. And so, um, I believe that universities should hold more hackathons. I believe that libraries should be a part of those types of um, 72 hour um, events where you bring together computer science students and, and librarians and um, IT staff and you kind of start to create this culture of not only experimentation but, but, but innovation and um, trying to, to generate as many potential solutions to this problem in as short amount of time as possible and creating a culture and habit of it. Um, and so any industry that we've seen that has sort of a predatory relationship with its, its customers has been disrupted from the outside. Uh, and so um, I think I'm looking at students and, and researchers uh, on your campus that are the ones who are the biggest victims of this uh, problem you're describing. And I think the university should be investing in them and supporting them to um, use their expertise, uh, whether that's software development, whether that's design thinking, 
um, mm. to, to, to put together solutions uh, to, to try to tackle these problems. And, and if as higher education as a community becomes more exper experiment friendly mm -hmm. and more mm -hmm. startup and innovation friendly, I think it's only a matter of time before publishers and vendors um, see the writing on the wall, um, that, that the next wave of eBooks and, and licensing will not be predatory. Uh, there's people interpreting Web 3.0 and blockchain as a potential solution for this particular problem you described. Hmm. I wonder how that would work um, in terms of uh, uh, possibly having uh, blockchain backed uh, checkout records or just individual copies that are that are backed um, using that to try and prevent piracy. Is that the idea? Um, and so I'm not the expert here. Um, I think okay. that the uh, decentralized approach of um, the way information is stored and, and on the blockchain um, provide some really interesting tools for um, universities and university presses and, and the publishing side and the research production side of universities to circumvent um, publishers that have been deemed predatory. And so uh, there, there are people right now that are thinking about the sort of supply chain of, of how research is produced. Mm -hmm and trying to understand how can universities become more independent um, using that, that technology uh, uh, infrastructure. Because right now the, the power has been consolidated with a few and um, we have to rethink the entire supply chain if we're going to sort of get ourselves out of this, this situation. But to rethink the entire supply chain. Um, George, thank you for the really good question. Uh, in the chat, uh, Tony, people have mentioned uh, two other uh, options, one being open access and scholarly publication, uh, and also some uh, large-scale negotiation for increased access. Uh, I think this is uh, Valerie Hawkins mentions uh, large-scale negotiation for scholarly materials. Um, but before, uh, before I say more about that, we have uh, uh, Carolyn Coward, who has one of the best library jobs just in the world. Uh, I want to make sure that you guys know that she's the head librarian at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So I'm just in envy of her every day. And she wanted to come on stage. Hello, Carolyn. Sound. Can you guys hear me? Yes. We can hear Hi, Caroline. In no? the car. Hang on. Hang on. No, no, you're fine. I'm we driving. Can I'm driving. Oh. Hang on. Oh, please be safe. Oh. Um, let me see. Yeah. I might need to come back and reconnect. Hang on. Okay, that's no problem. <laughs> wow, that's commitment. That's cool. Well, well Carolyn is wonderful. Um, and we're, we're getting a great 3D view of, of the inside of your car, Carolyn. Um, and while she's doing that, uh, while she's doing that, let me uh, uh, bring up one more question that has just come up that builds on what you were just talking about, Tony, in your answer to, uh, to George. This is from Naomi Tolkness. Uh, and uh, Naomi asked, <laughs> Source materials and textbooks. Okay. Um, sure. If you could be uh, more specific, is there something um, that you're you're curious about? I think from the skill type perspective, um, our goal is to ensure that each library professional has access to the right training material and support they need at the right time. And so um, we look at sort of the training that's required to become an expert in the, the area of, say, course materials, course reserves. Um, that's sort of our role in, in this community and this ecosystem is um, to try to make sure of this vast world of, 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 of resources that are being produced each day to learn about a topic, like say course reserves. Right. Our goal is to make sure that people have access to the right one at the right time, because the librarians and the library workers that support the university, they're too busy to sort of comb through <laughs> this, this vast world of, of conferences and webinars and 
um, workshops. Uh, and so that's sort of our goal, but I'm curious what you were getting at with course reserves um, and course materials. Uh, Naomi, um, please, if you want to join us on video, just click your raised hand that I can bring you up or, or otherwise just uh, type in a new question um, to, to say a bit more because it's, it's a great, great topic. Um, and um, we have, uh, let me bring up Carolyn now, now that she's, uh, um, I think, in a safer location. Yeah, Let's hopefully, see. Ho hopefully uh, yeah. <laughs> in a parking lot. Hi, Carolyn. Um, still driving, still driving. I've got a meeting on lab at, at noon, so I'm trying to get there. But um, thank you both. bringing up these uh, really critical issues and ideas. Um, I want to challenge, okay, just a little bit about me. Yes, I'm the head librarian at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, but I spent 20 plus years in higher education as an information literacy librarian, high impact practices, uh, when we used to call it bibliographic instruction, working for the California State University system for first generation, um, all kinds of underrepresented students who enter really behind the eight ball. So really that's my space, that's my affinity for those kinds of students and library patrons. So JPL totally different, working with engineers, technologists, scientists who really, the scientists in the library, engineers, not so much. They're like, get out of my garage, you know, manual, what manual? So. I want to challenge everybody here on this call because I think we are thinking small. And here's why I think we are thinking small. We are thinking of libraries and librarians. Yeah, and Tony, you, you mentioned this a couple of times as the sort of brick and mortar book repository. And yes, we are into technology. We've been all over the technology space for 30 years. Uh, information literacy, absolutely, but we're still kind of thinking of ourselves as librarians and how do we enhance what we do? How do we carry that forward and carry the message? My challenge is let's bust out of that. Let's turn that around uh, onto us and let's say, what else can we do on our campuses? Can we be data specialists? Can we be, be technologists? Can we be hired by the provost's office to work out that information mess that's in all of their file drawers? We have the expertise. We know how to do this. Let's present ourselves as something other than, and don't get me wrong, I am proud to be a librarian. I wear the L word on the t-shirt every day, absolutely. But what I've done at JPL is I have pulled my staff and my services up out of the traditional stuff, interlibrary loan, uh, print and electronic resources, uh, reference and bibliographies and all that, we are designing data repositories. We are heavily involved in data governance at JPL. I run uh, the ontology working group. I'm neck deep in taxonomy and metadata development. Let's really dig deep within ourselves to see what our training and our skill set can bring to the organization, focus on that, and hopefully once we get embedded in that, that will pull the support for the more traditional services along, especially from faculty and staff. Thank you. That's yeah, a fantastic happy. Yeah. Um I'm in. I'm in full. I'm in full agreement, Caroline. I think that uh, what we're observing today, um, skill type has a lot of um, insight into what skills are needed at libraries, um, what skills library workers are interested in learning, and I think things are 100% moving in the direction you state to be more sort of digital in the work. Um, and more data-driven in, in the work. I think part of the challenge gets back to uh, a sort of remark I made earlier that um, in order to sort of reconceive what our work looks like, um, and I'm not a librarian, but I just work with them every, every day to sort of have these conversations. We need to create a workplace environment that is um, more supportive of 
uh, the goals of these professionals. I think right now um, we're noticing collective um, morale um, issues. We're noticing burnout. We're noticing um, the effects of never having right size the pay grades to look more like IT. Um, we're noticing um, lack of management experience, uh, people being promoted to higher levels of, of responsibility because they did really well in, say, e-resources or mm -hmm. in research mm -hmm. data, but that doesn't translate into management and leadership. And so I think the pandemic sort of brought an exclamation point on mm. these organizational issues that um, many of our colleagues that went through library and information science programs, they never really learned the things that were being taught over in the MBA program. Uh, and, and so I think we're, we're observing that a bit. And, and in order for us to make this leap to where Caroline's describing, I think we first need to address the, the organizational culture and um, a lot of the issues that are being surfaced that right now are stifling people to reinvent themselves. Um, and, and so I, I think once we take care of the needs of our people, um, we, we work on the pay issue, we work on the morale and the, 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 the support and management issue, I think we now will have a healthier environment where we can do the, 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 the more exciting work of um, rethinking what does librarianship look like in, say, 2030. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, can I just say thank you to the two of you for having a conversation in extraordinary physical circumstances. Uh, it's, uh, uh, Carolyn is amazing, uh, and I appreciate the audacity of your question. And, and Tony, I love, I love your answer. I mean, you're, you're positioning librarians not only as IT professionals, but also as entrepreneurs as, uh, um, in that space. Uh, Ten years ago, I heard a faculty uh, librarian from a major Chinese university describe his team as information entrepreneurs. And I was always struck by that. Um, uh, we uh, to circle back one Naomi Toffness, um, have She both had an answer to your question, and she wanted to join us on stage. So let me just quickly beam her up on stage, see if, if we can make her uh, mic and camera work. Uh, Naomi, Naomi, we can neither see nor hear you. Um, in that case, Naomi, a good thing to do would be to relaunch this browser window, and then your browser should ask for access to your microphone and camera. So just give that a try. While you do that, I'll read your answer that you typed in as a text question. Um, her question it looks like this, or response. My specific university position seems unique in that I spend most of my time with course materials, and it has become a revenue generator for my university. Which is very interesting. Hmm. Uh, she's at Post University. Uh, and yeah, I think I, I, we can I, see her now. Let me, just, let me bring her up while you, while you think about that. Hello, Naomi. Hey, I'm going to switch you over here so I can stare at you and not at my other monitor. Um, yeah, so uh, I wish that my position like existed elsewhere, right? So that's why I wanted to bring it up. So. Um, okay. Essentially, in like a nutshell, I would say that my position is like a typical reference librarian for faculty, where I'm like helping faculty while they're developing courses and selecting course materials that are like appropriate for their courses. But also I have to like think a lot about, um, you know, accessibility and stuff because we're a mostly online school. Um, in a way that um, faculty as subject matter experts don't always necessarily think about that first. Um, so, and uh, I get to work remote half time. So uh, you can see that I'm in my home office right now. Um, so uh, I, I wish that this existed elsewhere, you know, and everybody has had to figure out what online learning means in the last two years so there's like no excuse for that anymore um i feel and so like everybody's trying to figure this out but also um there's no new positions in libraries 
that I see, you know, like people are desperate to hold on to the, the few positions that their institutions are allowing them to have. Um, and they're not, they're not able to like expand out um, in a way that would allow for a position like mine. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off now for uh, everyone's privacy, but I just wanted to uh, communicate that. Oh, it's great to see you. It's great to see you. Thank you for uh, thank you for your your persistence, Naomi, and thank you for telling us about uh, about your story. What, what do you think, um, Tony? Yeah, I think um, Naomi raises a, a, a good point that I think jumps back to the leadership conversation that uh, we had. I think. Uh, what we're seeing is this generational shift that's been being discussed for, I don't know, from according to some decades of mm -hmm. that there's this, uh, there was this retirement, um, a, there's this delayed retirement bubble mm -hmm. that started to grow in 2009 when the economic downturn happened and the people who were expected to retire decided to hold on a bit and the bubble started to grow, which started to reduce the supply of open positions. Uh, and for the last decade, since the downturn through now, through the pandemic, the bubble has been growing and um, mm -hmm. that bubble started to burst due to the pandemic, which created, I remember at one point in 2020, there were of the 126 Association of Research Library members, there were about 30 open university librarian positions at once. Wow. Like simultaneously. And I, I think I had a tweet thread about this two wow. years ago or whenever. And so there is this generational shift that's taking place. And this next generation of leaders, um, aren't bringing a lot of those ideas into their role. They have more of a blank canvas on how jobs should look, how the organization should look. Um, and so I think that's sort of a, a, a ray of uh, sunshine or silver lining rather to the pandemic is that new leaders of libraries have a different disposition. Um, they're more people oriented um, and they aren't bringing a lot of the uh, preconceived notions around what jobs should look like. They, they are open to rethinking what our role should look like. Uh, and so that's one response. I think we're going to see more progress on Naomi's challenge this decade than, than last. Thank you. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great vision. Uh, and Tony and, the, and, and Naomi, again, thank you for... Uh, uh, for your thoughtful outlining of the, of the question twice. Um, we had uh, in the chat is an interesting, perhaps, response to this, Tony. Uh, Eileen Frank says, when it comes to OER, I'm a librarian at two places that are totally committed, uh, UMCC and U of the People. Both universities are using OER for their courses. The community college where I work is getting their feet very wet. Librarians are helpers in that. Uh, so that, that seems to me like a, a new kind of librarian um, for, that, uh, for that world. Um, friends, we're, we're almost out of time, uh, and uh, you've been terrific at asking all kinds of questions. And I wanted to take the moderator's privilege and just quickly ask one question on my own, Tony. And this is a big one, uh, and, th and this points about two hours south of you. Um, I I'm wondering about the role of higher education in the climate crisis. I'm doing a lot of work on that. And in particular, I'm wondering, what is the role of the academic library in the climate crisis? I mean, there, I, you can see some, some immediate uh, roles, such as continuing to provide research materials for research universities on the topic. Uh, are there any other ways that you can foresee academic libraries playing a role as campuses join the rest of the world in this big struggle? Yeah, I think um, academic and also public libraries have a very um, particular interest in being at the table during this conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm born and raised in New Orleans. Um, Hurricane mm -hmm. Katrina was sort of a, a mm -hmm. turning moment for my entire family. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember um, Tulane University was gravely impacted by the flooding that took place. Um, mm -hmm. 
and it actually interrupted some of the uh, undergraduate thesis work I was doing at the Amistad Research Center at Tulane. Oh, man. And um, th that's not uncommon for libraries that are, say, um, in Florida or, or being impacted by, by sort of erosion and things. And so since the libraries does have a disproportionate amount of physical assets that need to be protected, um, they have a very strong um, uh, interest in this conversation. I think they also have experience with um, how to handle um, the handling of these rare books, rare assets um, that can um, be uh, learned from and serve as, as, as a guide for the rest of the institution. And so, um, part of the heaviest burden of responding to things like, like um, rising uh, water, part, the heaviest burden of that is placed onto the, the library system. Um, it's one thing to get the students out. It's a one, another thing to get um, um, other resources out. Um, mm -hmm. But research universities have a large physical footprint and, um, and the libraries are, are managing that. And so um, I don't think it's just about providing research to the experts to mm -hmm. make progress on solving climate change. I also think it's about um, emergency preparedness and, and, and how do you sort of galvanize um, and, and, and prepare to protect uh, the destruction and, and damage of, of physical assets. Well, that's a terrific answer. Uh Thank you, Tony. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I also appreciate the fact that we have just shot past the end of, the, of the, our scheduled hour. Uh, you've been terrific, Tony, answering a, a wide range of questions, uh, hitting uh, all kinds of aspects of the work you do. Uh, what's, what's the best way we can keep up with you and skill type? Uh, should we follow you on Twitter or do you have a newsletter? What's the best way? Mostly active on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, I wasn't able to keep up with the, the, the uh, maintenance of a newsletter I tried. Um, but yeah, just um, I'm publicly available at, at, at Sanders, my last name. Very, very good. Uh, well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. We're going to check back up on you and keep up with the uh, skill type. Uh, Thanks thank so much. Thank you. And don't go away, friends. I need to uh, point out what we're doing next and what else is coming up. Uh, so looking ahead, uh, if you want to keep talking about this, and clearly from the chat you do, uh, please just use the hashtag FTTE on Twitter or go to my blog, Brian Alexander, so that we can hear more about it, what you're thinking. We can keep the conversation going. Now, if you'd like to go back into our past discussions about libraries and other related topics, just go to tinyurl.com slash FDF archive. And if you'd like to look ahead to some of our other topics, again, we're looking at everything from the climate crisis that we were just talking about to public higher ed, Web3, how to pay for college. You just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. Thank you all for terrific questions. Thank you for volunteering so much about your individual work, your careers. Thank you all. Uh, please keep supporting libraries. Keep doing great work. Above all, take care and be safe. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.